Welcome to this evening's presentation by Our Spirit. It is part of our series of lectures entitled The Quest for Spiritual Pathways. Tonight's topic is Who is the Being of Anthroposophia? And that word Anthroposophia is quite complicated. And we're going to be speaking about what Rudolf Steiner, Dr. Rudolf Steiner, says about this being of Anthroposophia. Now, the title of our se series of lectures has to do with, do you ask yourself the questions that get you put onto that spiritual path? So last time our topic was transhumanism. And this topic we wanted to bring first because so many people have not asked themselves a very critical question that we brought up, which is, what is your cosmology? Who are you? Why are you here? And where are you going? And what is it that you are transforming into? So if there's transhumanism, the question arises, are you transforming into an angel or perhaps an animal or perhaps a mechanical animal? a machine animal? And these were the questions we asked last time. They're difficult questions, but they were topical because our previous series of lectures was on New World Awakening. And we presented many topics having to do with our apocalyptic time. And these things are rather scary and frightening, but they're a necessity that causes us to have to find a cosmology. And that is the answer to also what it is that we're presenting tonight and will be presenting in future talks. The next talk will be on the science of the Holy Grail, and it will be in reference to a book that we have recently written called The Hidden History of the Grail Queens. Tonight's talk, we will not have notes as we did last time, because what we'll be presenting is in a thousand page trilogy called The Gospel of Sophia, and it's three separate books. And some of the lectures we're gonna be talking about in the future have to do with the content of those books. But tonight, we're going to talk specifically about the biographies of the three different aspects of the divine feminine trinity. And for most people, they are so used to what they have been taught that even the concept of considering a divine feminine trinity is so foreign that they cannot even approach the concept. But as the title of our lecture series indicates, the quest for spiritual pathways, it's about whether you have questions, it's about whether you're on a quest and whether or not you can find the proper spiritual pathway for you. So what tonight's presentation is all about is what Tyla and I have gone through in our own spiritual pathway. And so I will be making some personal remarks about my own. But what I want to say is the Gospel of Sophia was written together, every single word by Tyla and myself, every single concept was discussed, every single word was edited and re-edited and rewritten. And you'll find that the three books have quite a unique approach to a new cosmology. But it's not a new cosmology as I found out in my own quest, it's an old cosmology that we must now bring into the modern times. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how it is that this being of Anthroposophia came to be such a question on my particular spiritual pathway. But before I do, I'll make one other remark. And that's that both Tyler and I, when we found ourselves together working on this topic some seven years ago, and we exchanged our notes of all of our lifetime study of religious and anthroposophical and theosophical concepts, we found that we were basically the only two people that we had met that agreed on this topic. And we agreed in absolute substance and point. But it was Tyla's concern that the previous types of writing that have happened concerning the goddess be brought into a new time and completely made into an experiential process for anyone reading the book. So some of these books actually look as if they are workbooks and they help you on the path to understand how to develop your own cosmology. Because if you don't believe it and if you don't have a direct experience of it, the cosmology is going to do you no good. 
The worldview needs to inform you so that your perceptions change in relationship to it. So we presented a cosmology in these books, but we also presented a path of initiation, a new path of initiation that doesn't just build on the old ideas of the divine feminine trinity of birth, death, and rebirth, which has now become quite common and accepted in theological circles, ecclesiastical circles, philosophical circles. You can actually discuss these things with people, but you will not find many people stating what it is that Tyla and myself have put together in this Gospel of Sophia. So if you want notes on this talk, almost everything in this talk will be found in those three books. So I'm standing in a room here that I have debated people like Sergei Pakoviev and Robert Powell and many others in conferences here in this area and in this room. And as a matter of fact, Tyle and I met as I asked a very rude, because I was quite a rude, young, brash, a firebrand when I was young, quite choleric. And I asked Sergei Pakoviev, who as he was presenting in this very room, you know, why is it that you, like so many anthroposophists, when you get to three-fourths of the way through your talk, you say in a sacred tone the word, the words, the being of anthroposophia. And then you go on and you never tell anybody what that means. And so I confronted him here and I said, look, I'm really tired of this because you're a young guy and I love your work, but you know, I want to know, why is it that you're not writing about this being of Anthroposophia when it's so central and, and principle and it's like the one thing that every single great anthroposophist I ever knew always defers to three-fourths of the way through the hour and 45-minute lecture, and that is the being of Anthroposophia. And they never explain it. I spent my youth traveling, actually, to every place I could where there are anthroposophists whose books I'd read, to say to them, like, you know, Carl Stegman or John Hunter, or I've met dozens of people who knew Rudolf Steiner when he was alive, and I would ask them these questions. Who is this being of Anthroposophia? I never got a satisfactory answer. So I was on a path from a very early age to figure this out. Now, what I'm about to tell you is only because my beautiful title tells me that I can say this out loud now, and I have ref never really talked about this ever in public. But I was born, I guess you'd call it like a seer. I could have, I had clairvoyance, clairaudience, and clairsentience from birth. And I was dedicated to the church because of that. And so in my high school years, I became a, I tried to become a priest. I did what's called religious formation and got a degree, multiple degrees in that. And I became a priest. I was actually ordained in a very unusual way. But I noticed as a youth, that in church, the moral people in that church, because I was clairvoyant, I could see this, but let me just explain first off. Clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, complete misnomers. When you have a clairvoyant intuitive experience, it has nothing to do with normal sight, normal hearing, or in any way your normal feelings of touch or anything to do with the outside world. It has nothing to do with that. As a matter of fact, if it has any of that in it, it probably isn't a true spiritual intuition. So I would notice in churches that this being, this female being would come in as a child, I noticed this, into people as they were praying. And then it would come into them, and then it would come out and stand in front of them. And this happened so many times, I can't explain it to you. I, I can't count the number. Uh, but what I did notice is many of the priests, this never happened with them. This, I was in the Catholic Church, of course, at that time. And so many of the people I met in the Catholic Church, they didn't have this experience of this being. So I asked my teacher early on, when I started training as a priest at age 14, who is this being? And he says, well, that's Mother Mary, of course. I said, Mother Mary, okay. So I focused on this, tried to understand the Immaculate Conception, the Virgin Mary. I tried to understand every aspect of the feminine divine. So by the time that later I again left and re-entered the Catholic Church and I was getting a degree in uh, a PhD in philosophy and a PhD in comparative religion and my Doctor of divinity, I was a terrible thorn in the side of the Catholic Church because they, I would say to them, you're talking about this male trinity of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. And you might give a little bit of feminine qualities to the Holy Spirit. That's very nice of you, but that isn't really the way it works. Not the way that I can tell. And so I went to the documents that they recognize in the Catholic Church for their doctrine and dogma. And I pointed out to them what any of us would notice, but we were told not to notice, which is, what does the second verse of the Genesis say? And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Who's the face? Who's the waters? I would ask them this over and over again, and then they would push me on to the next group and say, no, we really don't want to talk to you about the feminine divine. And so I started to realize that there was this in a way, there had been a terrible thing called the curse of Eve that had ended up being a, literally the act of doctrine of many churches. And there are writers who say that until the curse of Eve is overcome, we are really not going to advance much further. So as I was in the church and I was looking at this, of course, mostly with men, mostly of whom didn't like women and certainly did not have the moral uprightness to have the experience that I was seeing with people, you know, the humble uh, old lady in the front pew, or, you know, the, any, the humble people, the people who were moral, they had this experience. I could see it. And I could see it happening in myself too. And I never really asked this being, who are you? I just called her the, the beautiful lady because from my youth, that's the being, that's how she'd come. And I'd say, well, the beautiful ladies here are very nice. And then, of course, I assumed it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Well, the further I studied, the more I found out that it was much, much more complicated than that. And then in the 70s, when Maria Gambutas put out her first book on the ancient gods and goddesses of old Europe, and her second book, The Language of the Goddess, and her third book, and all of her work, I became very excited because now I had something that could substantiate what my experience was. When I looked into the doctrine, when I looked into the Holy Scripture, it was very clear. The divine feminine was primal. There was really no way to argue that. For instance, and, and as I say, many of these things are blatantly in our face and we ignore them all the time. What did Jesus of Nazareth say, Jesus Christ? He said, I and my, the Father are one, but my Father's kingdom and this kingdom are not the same. I must go from this kingdom to his. So basically what he was saying is, the Father God doesn't manifest in this world, so anything that we might see is not really the Father God. And that's the reason that supposedly the Son God, or the Son of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, came down to earth to bring that divine force down to earth. Well, I could understand that. That seemed right to me. And then the Holy Spirit was remaining afterwards and really didn't come down, it seems, until Christ said, I will send the Comforter to you. So they would argue with me. These are some of the great minds in the Catholic Church. And they would argue with me and say, no, no, no. You don't quite understand the way that this works. That the Father, even the Father has feminine qualities. The Son has feminine qualities. And the Holy Spirit may even somehow be merged magically with the Virgin Mary. Well, this was completely unsatisfactory to me, and I knew that it wasn't true. And I continued my religious devotion uh, to the Rosary and to the Way of the Cross and to Stations of the Cross and all those kind of things. Um, but basically, I couldn't find anyone in the Catholic Church to get, that could explain this to me. So I continued to look. Now, interestingly enough, before I went back into the Catholic Church, second or third time, depending on how you want to look at it, I had already read everything that I could in English of Rudolf Steiner. And Dr. Rudolf Steiner, of course, is the founder of Anthroposophy, and he's the one who coined the term Anthroposophia. So the word Sophia, we all know, that means wisdom. But the word Anthropo means human, the human being, but it also is the Gnostic term for the perfected human being. One could literally say that the word anthropo means Christ. It means the perfected human being. And so, in a way, Rudolf Steiner's injunction in our time, which he repeated over and over again, is it is not the understanding of Christ and the encounter of Christ that we must worry about at this moment in time. We must find the wisdom of Christ. 
the Sophia of Christ, which lets us understand who the cosmic Christ is. Now, that's a little bit complicated. So when we say the Sophia of Christ, the wisdom of Christ, we would call that Sapintia, or we would call it Shekinah, or we could call it a thousand names. And you can read the book by Caitlin Matthews if you want to see all the different female names that will describe to you who this being of wisdom is. Prajnaparamita, she was called in, uh, in Hindu and Sanskrit and in Tibetan Buddhism. So this being of wisdom, this Sophia, we know by just studying the Bible, appears, and this being of wisdom has a name that is very unfamiliar to people, named the Kyriotetes. So we hear of Rudolf Steiner speaking of this being of Anthroposophia, yes, and in ways that I'm going to describe in a minute, we hear basically all the great uh, writers of the Psalms and Leviticus and uh, Ecclesiastes. These are love poems to Sophia. It says, what is greater than Sophia? What is greater than wisdom? Nothing. Neither gold nor silver, diamonds or rubies. No precious stone can possibly be compared to the quest for the spiritual path to find Sophia. And so no matter where you look, in whatever religion, it doesn't matter. You're going to find a few things. That the primary beings of creation, or the, specifically the primary one being of creation, is feminine. Then you're going to find something that is a rule. It's called an esoteric axiom. And that is that all things proceed in seven. And then later on, I'm going to refer to something called, well, also there's another rule, and that's that the microcosm is the mirror of the macrocosm. And another rule, which is that that seven manifests in the way that I'm just about ready to describe for you. Because if you don't have this cosmological understanding, it is impossible or certainly difficult to understand who the being of Anthroposophia is. And to try to understand why the being of Anthroposophia might be different than the being of wisdom. And to add the third element. Who is the being that Rudolf Steiner refers to as the mothers, which we'll come to in a minute. So when we use one of those esoteric axioms, and a, a, a third one is that all things proceed through the interaction of vortices. As a matter of fact, everything in the world comes into being because of a vortex or interacting vortices. So the rule of seven is very simple. It's like a pendulum that starts very high and swings down and comes through one, two, three stages and reaches a fourth and then starts to go back to where it came from with its momentum to a fifth, sixth, and seventh stage. And then it returns to where it came from. This simple process can be found from everything from the way that the planets form to the way a monarch butterfly lives. And it's certainly found in the human being. So this magic of seven we're going to talk about quite extensively because for the human being, you can find seven in your brain, in the ventricles of the brain, and the chambers of the heart. And I know people will say there's only four chambers of the heart, there's only five ventricles, but that isn't true. And that you find that the heart is surrounded by six organs. So you have a central pillar and six organs, which actually reflect the planets. And in the ancient times, this was called the Temple of Wisdom. Now, why is it that as we look at the descent into matter, when we come to the fourth stage, we can come to consciousness. But before that, we were actually benefiting from what Rudolf Steiner calls the Mars phase of incarnation. And then after the central turning point of time, the very lowest point when matter was in fact through entropy dying, it enters into the Mercury stage. And that stage then leads us into the fifth, sixth, and seventh aspects of these seven. Now, Rudolf Steiner refers to these aspects as incarnations of the earth because we're on the earth now. But the earth has elements here 
the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the human kingdom. But only the human kingdom was actually created for the first time in this fourth period, this period we call the earth. The three previous periods he calls, and it's hard to explain this, but he calls them Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth. Now, the debates I had with Robert Powell, and literally it made him change his first book, The Most Holy Trinity Sophia, changed all the concepts. He got the concepts of a divine trinity from Valentin Tomberg's book, Christian Hermeticism, and he got it from the Kabbalah from looking at the tree of life, the tree of Sephiroth. But when we're talking about a trinity, most of the people who have written about this, even the people who have written about a divine trinity, do not explain what Rudolf Steiner has clearly stated. I can name many times in this very room that I sat or in the library with Virginia C's and with Sergei, and we debated this topic. And the debates became very heated because my first question to him when I first met him was, what do you think of Robert Powell's Most Holy Trinity Sophia? And he stood right here and said, I don't read Robert Powell. And I thought, well, that's very nice of you. That's, hmm, okay. And so I asked him, well, what do you say about Valentin Tomberg and uh, what he says about the fact that there's a co-equal divine feminine trinity? And he didn't want to answer the question, so I approached him personally again and again, year after year, and eventually I wrote a book called Goddess Meditations. Virginia Cease wrote uh, a review of it and um, some endorsements of it and made sure that he got it, and this was part of our debate back and forth. Eventually, he wrote his book, The Heavenly Sophia and the Earthly Being of Anthroposophia. And I would say to him, Sergei, that's very good, but you missed the third point. So you have the being of wisdom, you have the being of anthroposophia, but where is the mother being who was there, the face of the deep, what, that the Greeks called the halix, that the, well, there are many, many names. Every religion has a name for this being who was there to begin with. When Brahman or whoever, it doesn't matter, the male god, somehow worked with the substance that was already there. So who is this being? This is the being that Rudolf Steiner referred to as the mothers. Now, Sergei would debate with me and say, no, Rudolf Steiner doesn't say that. And I said, oh, yes, he does. He says it in the Faust lectures. In the Faust lectures, he says it many times, dozens of times, that the mothers are the three previous ages of the incarnation of the earth. Saturn, sun, and moon together are the triple goddess, the great goddess, the mother of all, the magna mater. The, um, it, no matter where you look in any religion, you're going to find a trinity of divine feminine beings who literally have the power over the gods, not just humans. Um, the Nornies, the three sisters who ruled time, past, present, and future, they sat underneath the Yggdrasil tree, and yet when they cut the cord, the leaf would fall, the verse says, or even a god would die. So it came down to whether it was the Gorgons or the Furies or the Nornies or uh, so many triple goddesses. For instance, Athena had three different natures. Aphrodite had three different natures. Hera had three different natures. Yet almost every god, goddess of the ancient culture, had three different natures. So there you see the mothers. And Rudolf Steiner said that the reason that people don't understand the mothers is because they terrify you. To face the mothers is the most terrifying thing you can possibly do in an incarnation as a human being. It's worse than facing your own doppelgangers. Why? Because it actually consumes your three lower bodies, your astral body, your etheric body, and your physical body. You basically have to give them up so that you could actually witness these three mothers. And then Rudolf Steiner said, out of uh, absolute clarity, that the three became one, and that she became the mother. Now, most interestingly is that Sergei and I would debate this, and I would say, now, Sergei, 
I know you don't want to accept that version of Steiner saying that there's a mother goddess or a mother being. But if you add that to the two that you've described in your books, then you have a trinity, don't you? And he'd say, well, no, you're going to have to find other quotes from me. So I did. And the quote, it took me many years to find the quote again. But the quote is when Rudolf Steiner is speaking to the workman in the workman's lectures. And he states the following, that Aristotle had 10 categories. And those 10 categories are what we could then look out upon the outside world and we could put them in a hierarchical ranking that could understand practically anything there was. But that that was then rewritten by Dionysius the Areopagite as the nine hierarchies, the Christian hierarchies. And so those 10 categories became the philosophical understanding of what we knew before in ancient times through really the wisdom that fl flowed in the blood. That is how they knew these things in the past because they had what Rudolf Steiner called atavistic clairvoyance or blood clairvoyance. And it was completely different than awake clairvoyance. It was a trance clairvoyance and it was based upon tribalism. It was based upon the beings, the archangels that ruled over tribes and ruled over languages. And so when we understand who the mother is or the mothers, then we understand that from the beginning, that is the being who was there at the moment of creation. That is the face upon the deep. That is a being who is called in ancient Hindu philosophy, Vak. Now let's remember, and Vak is voice or sound or dance. And Vak was primary, primal to Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. And as we know, Brahma had his consort, Swarasvati, who was actually more powerful than Brahma. Brahma didn't even manifest in the world. Swarasvati brought all the beautiful music of the spheres through her playing of her veena and her instruments. And then you have with the, that is the God of creation. Well, with the Hindu gods, you have Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, or birth is Brahma, death is Shiva, and sustenance or life or rebirth is Vishnu, who was also 10 different incarnations, including Krishna and Rama and others. But in every incarnation, he had a mate. And Vishnu has a mate, Lakshmi. So when you look, you say, well, there's these six beings, two different trinities. But in the middle of them is their mother. And her name is Vak. She is what we would call the logos or speech. She is literally the creatrix, the goddess that created things. She would literally be what Rudolf Steiner called the mothers. Now, once we reach the time of earth incarnation, what happens is quite interesting. When we look at the nine hierarchies, Rudolf Steiner said the nine hierarchies, because one of the workmen they always ask great questions and they'd ask him the simplest questions and then he'd give these answers that he doesn't say anywhere else. And so they said, well, I don't quite understand what you're saying, Dr. Steiner. What, what are these categories? And he says, well, and he explained it again. And then they said, no, but is there a word for them? And he says, yes, there's a word for them. It's the word suffering. If you took the nine Christian hierarchies, which I'll delineate in a second, and all of them sounded at once. You would hear the word suffering. And the workman said, no, that wasn't good enough. Now, what do you mean by that, Dr. Steiner? And he says, well, you could take that word and replace it with the word the great goddess or the mother of all. So the great goddess is the combined working of the nine hierarchies. The mother of all, which Steiner refers to, the Magna Mater and other, many other uh, names for her, that is the working of the nine hierarchies. Now, the nine hierarchies starts off with, we, we know these names. We've seen them in the Bible. They start off with the being of love, whose name is Seraphim, the being of harmony, Cherubim, the beings of will power called the thrones. And then you get to the second rank of the hierarchies. And then the being who is called the being of wisdom is given the Greek name Kyriotetes. The being below that is called in Greek dynamis, 
and that is the uh, being who, they're called powers, mights, and dominions. So those are the beings of mights. They're also the beings of motion. They create the motion of the planets, the motion of the stars, uh, our relationship to the stars and all the stars. But the being of wisdom creates everything from the stars to the earth. And remember that in most cultures, the sun is seen as feminine. So the sun itself and the stars and the moon and all of these factors were in fact the body of the goddess. And this is a wisdom that was found in many ways in, in, in most temples. And so I'm going to focus now here on the Greek temples because they are absolutely a beautiful example of what I'm talking about. And then in a minute, I hope to go to the feminine cultures that were developed in the Minoan culture, the Mycenaean culture, and in Troy, because Helen represented this being of wisdom and represented really the forces of love through Aphrodite. And that's what the whole Trojan War was about. So, when you look at the fact that, let's just look at the Minoans. It was a goddess-centered culture. They didn't have walls. They didn't have weapons. They lived peacefully. And the amazing thing about them, I, had, I went there because I had found these incongruencies and I said, I, I'm going to go study. I'm gonna go there, I need to see the artifacts themselves. So I went there and what I noticed is the following that every Greek temple had an ophalos in it, omphalos, O-M-P-H-A-L-O-S, omphalos. And it's a sacred stone. It's called the navel. And the strange thing about it was, though the temples might be knocked down, you'd go there and you'd see this ancient omphalos, this sacred stone sitting there. And you'd say, that doesn't make any sense. Sometimes on a pillar, and this was the obelisk of the Egyptians, and the Omphala stone in Egypt was called the Bin Bin stone or the Bin Bine stone. And it's the same thing. And it is a representation of the great goddess. And on the outside of this stone, which is hollow, with a hole in the top, they would put this over the sulfuric fumes coming out of the ground at, De uh, at uh, Delphi. And the women, who again, we'll talk about in a second, but the, it was the women who always could still sense through ancient clairvoyance, the message of the gods. And so they would become overwhelmed with the fumes. But it was said that the voices they heard came from the omphalos. And so they would put this tripod over the navel of the world and the omphalos would speak. Well, what is the omphalos? You can go to all these Greek temples and the old omphaloses are still there. Why didn't the people who knocked them down take them? It made no sense to me until I did further research. So I went to Canossus of the island of Crete, and there I saw the answer. Now we know that the stories, the myths say that Zeus brought Europa, a Phoenician princess from Tyre across the Mediterranean to the island of Crete to begin Europe. That was the beginnings of Europe. And the reason they say this is when you go there at Canossus, you will see outside of this fantastic palace, which is the Palace of the La Labyrinth, and it's been rebuilt, and it's beautiful, and they've repainted it, and it's just, it, it's like the, it was in the ancient times. But outside of them are kivas, these domes built out of stone, ancient, and at the top is a hole, and there's a ladder that goes down into it. Well, if you go in down inside, what are you going to find? You're going to find what they call the first throne of Europe, and it is a birthing throne. And it is the throne that the queen, and when you were birthing, you were the queen, because there really were no queens there. Everybody is the queen. If you're having a baby, you're a queen. And the bones of the midwives were buried underneath the only bed inside of that kiva, that dome, which was a representation of the pregnant woman's belly. And what is it? That's the navel. And it's the umbilical cord that goes into the spiritual world. So this was the throne and she held the horns of the bull because it was the age of Taurus. And as they gave birth, these were the sacred mysteries. Now, I'm standing there looking at this going, this is ridiculous. They're trying to tell me that behind this throne 
is a stylized hatchet, an axe, a two-headed axe. Well, they didn't have weapons. So I thought, this is absurd. I looked closely. It was the wings of the bee. And the omphalos is a beehive. And it represents the tribal consciousness that still had clairvoyance from the ancient days. And so that is the reason that even when the Persians attacked the Greeks, they didn't break the omphalos. They bowed before it. Because the Persians go back to worship of the Magna Mater, the Great Mother, Sibel, Ops, Isis. And so what we saw, what I saw there, and as I saw throughout the entire Mediterranean, was that the Greek culture, when it became a dominant male culture through Zeus, who was born in the island of Crete, by the way, in a cave, and to his mother Rhea, the mother earth, this being I'm talking about of wisdom. And so Zeus was born and he brought, of course, the male patriarchy. And it is said that the stone that Cronus ate in place of Zeus, because he had eaten his three previous siblings, Saturn, Sun, Moon, and now, Zeus didn't get eaten. The stone, the goddess stone, was put in his mouth and Cronus ate it. And that's the reason Zeus lived and became the new power that ascended Mount Olympus instead of the previous power of Cronus, the being of time. So you can see in the Mediterranean a transition between the ancient matriarchal culture that Rudolf Steiner said, not one day before 2101 BC, was there not a matriarchal culture ubiquitously throughout the world? So in other words, what Maria Gambutas had proven with the bronze and the Neolithic and even the Paleolithic age, that they were all matriarchal centered, all female centered, has now been proven. And this has been proven again and again through a variety of ways, mitochondrial DNA and other such things. And so what we see right there in the Mediterranean is a perfect example of the subsuming of the goddess culture. For instance, Helen of Troy. Well, she wasn't Helen of Troy. She was born in Sparta, and at age 10, she was stolen by Theseus and taken to the Acropolis, and there a cult of Aphrodite was started, and later it turned into a cult of Athena. Three goddesses were worshipped there to this very day. The goddess that represents Demeter, through the Coriobantes, through Harvest, the goddess Athena, who was the warrior goddess, and the goddess Nike. And I'll describe that in a minute, but Theseus stole Helen. And so a war was started, in the, and her brothers, strangely enough, Helen and her sister Clymenestra were both born in an egg. And we can get into great detail what that means. But her, their brothers, the Dioscora, uh, Castor and Pollux were also born out of an egg. They came and stole Helen from Theseus, King Theseus, the Theseus who had to pay the tribute to, the, uh, to um, the labyrinth on the island of Crete. And they took, he, they took their sister back to Sparta. And then, of course, Paris, through the determination of the apple of discord presented to the three goddesses by Eris, during the wedding of Peleus and Thetis in the cave of Chiron, it was that very moment when the gods, the heroes, the goddesses, and humans all came together for the first time. And so it was at that moment that they said, ah, we will ask the fairest human being to decide which of the goddesses is the fairest. And they chose Paris because he was the fairest of the human beings, of men. And he, of course, went with the cult of Aphrodite. Well, that is what she is. She was part of the cult of Aphrodite. But in Troy, they had the Palladium, which represented the goddess cult. And at the end of the Trojan War, Aeneas supposedly brought it to Rome, and the Greeks brought it back to Athens. And there, upon the Acropolis, in the Temple of Athena, in her hand, the Palladium was placed. Now, the Palladium was a meteorite, and it is now known quite well and quite acknowledged that in all the ancient temples throughout the world, 
media rights were held sacred. And if they didn't have a media right, then they would take a stone and they would carve it into the shape of like a bullet, the tip of a bullet, a cone, basically a tetrahedron that has been inflated. In other words, the pyramid on top of the obelisk. Now, this stone, these meteorites, were gifts of the goddess. And they brought fire, and that's the reason the goddesses always took care of fire. And the Vestal Virgins took care of the Palladium after it was taken from Troy, supposedly. And then they, they also brought, it brought fire, it brought metal that they could work, that, that then they could turn stone into temples. But it also brought sometimes what was called blood rain. So a meteorite would fall, and then there would be a tremendous amount of what looked like blood, and now they have, we'll talk about this in the next talk, but it has been proven that it is just like blood. Now this is bizarre to think that you're going to look out into the vast expanses to the goddess, and she's gonna send you a meteorite that brings blood. Now that sounds crazy, but here's something crazier. They believed 100% that when they looked out into the stars and they saw the Milky Way, that they were looking at the goddess, and that she had provided them with her milk, and that the great philosophers and the people and the god, the priestesses and the priests who were doing their worship of this being understood literally that it was the milk of the goddess that brought humans into existence. Sounds crazy. No, not crazy at all. There is a substance that they've now found called galactose, which looks exactly like human DNA, and it is exactly like mother's milk and it exists in the spiral nebulas of our own galaxies and in space. And it's held there in abeyance by ethanol. And so some speculate that literally the mother's milk of the goddess did come to the earth and that's what created us. And that when we needed fire, she sent meteorites. And when we needed hard metals, she sent the meteorites that had all kinds of metals in them. Amazing, palladium, it had every type of metal and also olivine, all kinds of things. And so what are we told? It's the Holy Grail, really. It's this gift from the goddess to the earth. Well, all of the earth and everything we see, though it is actually held together by unseen forces, are the gifts of the goddess, the gifts of the mothers. But now here on earth, the control of creation of the earth was controlled by the beings I just described as the beings of wisdom. So wisdom, motion, and form, or powers, mights, and dominions, or Elohim, Exousiae, Dunamis, and Exousiae, many names for these beings. But the point is, is that this being of wisdom came down out of that realm, but only working through that realm, not that she originated there, so this being of wisdom worked through the realm of the Kyriotides and came down through the other realms of motion, of form, into the realms that we call the time beings or the archai, and below them the archangels, and below them the angels and the human kingdom below. So the nine hierarchy, as they all sound together, actually say the name of the great goddess. And this was a shock to every anthroposophist I ever brought this up to. But I made sure that I showed them where it came from, and once they thought about it, there was no one that has ever yet been able to argue with what Rudolf Steiner has said about this. So what we see then with the culture of the goddess being transformed in, on the island of Crete, we see that the matriarchal culture was not one of war, it was one of peace. It was one where they were literally interacting with nature in a way, for instance, with bulls. They did ac acrobatics with bulls. They would let the bull come at them and they would put their hands in the bull horns and leap over the bull. But this was really an initiation and it was only for the women. And so you see that the goddess culture on Manoa, the most classic example is the goddess who has no name, and she's holding up two snakes, one in each hand, and she's got clothes from the waist down, but on her head will be one of 12 different animals. And when you look at this, you say, what does this mean? Why would their goddess 
have this. Well, the snake was the being of Lucifer. That is the snake that wrapped around the tree who spoke into Eve's ear. Well, Asclepius, the great healer of Greece, said that he was taught by his mother and that he simply held the snake to his ear and the wisdom that the snake would tell him gave the, the medicine for the Greek people. So it was again a transmission just like with Socrates. Socrates was taught by a woman. That's the reason he wrote nothing down. It was the tradition that it was all oral. And if we look at Rudolf Steiner and we go far back into time, it was women who invented speech through singing. And it was women who invented even writing through the pictograms because these were a relationship they had, first off with the sun and later with the moon processes for birth. But it was women who first learned to speak, women who first developed memory, women who first developed written records. And so we cannot underestimate what I quoted last time, which is a Rudolf Steiner's description of entering the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age. He said in 3101 BC that a flood swept over human beings like a, a diminution of consciousness, as if they were literally in a flood, and that he names the being who for the next, well, from 3100 in 1 BC until, as he points out in this lecture that I quoted from, uh, Earthly and Cosmic Man, that that age of the Dark Age of the Kali Yuga was over in 1899. And so you have those 3,000 years and these 2,000, and that's the 5,000 years which a Yuga takes to transpire. So we are in a new Yuga. As of 1900, we entered into a golden age called the Sata Yuga, the Kriya Yuga. And it is the age when the 10th incarnation of Vishnu happens, the God who continuously comes back and sustains life on earth. And this time Vishnu will appear as a woman, called Kalki. But Kalki is coming to basically chop off the heads of anyone who got caught in the materialism of the dark age of the Kali Yuga, which was led by a being that only Rudolf Steiner names as Prometheus, who later he names as the being of Araman. And he says that in our time, the materialism that we're fighting comes from really that age of Kali Yuga that we're still hanging on to instead of moving into a new age. And the new age is led by, in fact, a goddess, a powerful goddess who carries a sword like as described with Prajnaparamita or in uh, Tibetan Buddhism with Manjushri or with Vajrayogini or so on and so forth. There's many different descriptions of this feminine goddess who now comes to lead us into a golden age. But how does she do it? Not by resurrecting the old nonsense of ancient mysteries and by doing um, Gene Houston type reenactments of these ancient mysteries, which will mean nothing to us. We barely can understand what a Greek thought, just going back that far. To go back even further to the ancient mysteries, especially the blood mysteries, and to undo the curse of Eve takes much more than reenacting old mysteries. We have to have, as Tyler insisted when we wrote everything we've written, the seven books we've written, every word was written together with one thought in mind, and that's to make it experiential. If it is not experiential, what is the point? What is the point of theoretical philosophy or theoretical ecclesiastical philosophy or even religion per se, even practicing religion, if you don't have an experience. And that's what I was after. Who is this being that is there when people have this spiritual experience? Well, I had searched all around and many of these things I'd come across as I've described now. And what I found was Helen of Troy would have had to be 900 years old when she was in Troy. I don't think she still would have been the most beautiful woman in the world. She was a representation of Aphrodite. And the Palladium was a meteorite that fell from the sky that represented Pallas Athena, or the winged Nike. And if you look at the statues of winged Nike, she has no head. And later, when the Persians came and ran, overran the Acropolis, they stole Nike and knocked the wings off. And so that is what's happened to the great goddess culture. The wings have been clipped. We need to give those wings back. And in the apocalypse, when we talk about the woman with the moon beneath her feet, 
and the stars above her head and the sun at her heart. We are talking about this being who is threefold. We're not talking just about the being who was there at creation, who we call the mothers. We're not talking about just this being called Kyriotetes, the being of wisdom that all the ancient texts say, you should do everything you can, give up your family, your home, your life, everything to seek wisdom. Because when you find her, it's the answer to all things. Well, it's not her either. It was another being that I had never seen anything in any reference anywhere, except to hear about the tongues of flame from the Holy Spirit and such matters, or to give the Holy Spirit some feminine qualities, or so on and so forth. And so people thought when we first brought these ideas forward, especially to anthroposophists, that we simply did not understand what was going on. But that's not true. What we had to do is we had to name a couple of things that Rudolf Steiner did not name. One of them is key to understanding who the being of the Kyriotetes, uh, the being of wisdom who worked through the Kyriotetes, who also worked with the descent of the Christ from the Trinity, who then entered into the doorway, Rudolf Steiner says, through the Kyriotetes, through the beings of wisdom. And it was working with the beings of wisdom that the being of love, Christ, actually brought the form of the human being's I, the ego, the I am, and worked directly with the beings of the Kyriotetes. So when you talk about the being of wisdom, you're talking about the beings of the Kyriotetes who work directly with the beings of the sun, called the Elohim, or the Exousiae, or the spirits of form, and they worked together. And they then descended through the ranks below them, the Archai, the Archangels, the angels, and of course, as we know, the spirit of Christ entered into Jesus of Nazareth for three years, once and only once in all of human evolution, called the turning point of time. And then we also know that this being of the Kyriotetes descended and overlighted Mary and brought to Mary the virgin nature of the same pure spirit that was in the body of Jesus of Nazareth who was born in the Essene community. His mother, Mary of Nazareth, the Essene community, was the sister soul that was held back on the sun at the same time that what we would call, what is called in the Kabbalah and Rudolf Steiner calls Adam Kadman, the pure, unsullied spirit of the human being, the first human being that never incarnated until the time of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, at the same time, Emil Bach says that there was a feminine spirit and that we would have to also understand that she was part of this process. That process, you could even name Eve Kadman. And this Adam and Eve Kadman, Christ on the cross was the second Adam, who basically was the purified Adam Kadman that came to redeem the fall from paradise by taking the tree of knowledge of good and evil and turning it into the tree of the cross. But at the very same time, the, what is called the mother of Jesus, they call her Mary, her name was Sophia, and the other Marys standing underneath that cross at a time just before Christ went to the Jordan. The wisdom that had been in the body of Jesus of Nazareth was transferred to her. And at that moment, and it's too hard for me to explain in a short period of time, but that was not his mother. But at that moment, he transferred to Sophia so much wisdom of a human and so much wisdom of Michael and the cosmic wisdom and the wisdom of Sophia, the wisdom of the Kyriotetes, that she became literally the purified Eve again, because in fact, she had been the original Eve. So standing beneath the cross, you see Adam and Eve being redeemed by the new Adam and Eve, the Eve Kadman and the Adam Kadman. Well, this was also accompanied by the presence of a being called Anthroposophia. Now, the mothers at that point 
brought all of creation to the point where the earth had literally slowed down and was dying. And Christ brought the new blood that dropped into the earth, that renewed the earth and turned the earth into a star, a budding star. And so the mysteries that we see with the three Marys are basically there with the three Sophias. The mothers are there. The being of wisdom is there. And here is the third part. I saved the best for last because it was so confusing to me. I had studied philosophy. I'd studied Ralph Waldo Emerson's um, most beautiful description of what happens with the history of the nat human natural intellect. And it was the same thing that Rudolf Steiner said. And I'd read Rudolf Steiner's book, The Riddle of Philosophy. And it basically, he says, was the biography of this being of Anthroposophia. I'd read the few quotes that Steiner had given, saying that at the founding of the first Skirtianum and the founding of the Christmas Foundation meeting, that the being of Anthroposophia was there present in every way except having a physical body. So this being, Rudolf Steiner says, is the midwife of your soul, different than your guardian angel, and different than the wisdom that is brought to you by Michael, who is literally, he calls the son of Sophia, the son of the beings of wisdom is the archangel Michael. Different than your guardian angel is this being of Anthroposophia. And as I mentioned before, she goes in through the body, exactly as Rudolf Steiner says, knocks in the heart. When you take spiritual advanced steps, she enters into you and then records that. So it's never lost. And then steps outside of you and you then can objectively look at the spiritual step that you just took. In other words, she's the midwife of your spirit. She is that part that makes your soul into the Virgin Mary, into the Virgin soul. Now, this is displayed by Rudolf Steiner by saying that the three Marys represent the three soul forces. And that, of course, the mother of Jesus represented the consciousness soul or the spiritual soul. And that is the grail. That is what we must purify, or as is said in the apocalypse, you put on the white gown and you hide under the throne and there you are protected and for a thousand years, it's beautiful. And then you become like the lamb who has been slain. And what happens then? New Jerusalem comes from heaven and you marry in a wedding, a spiritual wedding, the very being that the dragon and the beast tried to consume, but couldn't. And what is she given? Wings just like the wings of the queen of Canossus or the wings of the queen of the Minoans. And with those wings, she is taken to a high mountain, but she returns in the city of New Jerusalem and there next to the tree of life where the four rivers flow, the lamb who is slain marries this queen of heaven. And who is this queen of heaven? Who is this being? It's not one being, it's three separate beings. And if you don't know this, you cannot possibly understand it. The being of Anthroposophia, as I said before, when the Kali Yuga started in 3100, a bizarre thing happened. Not only the flood that I mentioned, but when the people rose up, the few who were left, 3100, what happened? Megalithic building all over the world ubiquitously. Every single culture seemed to wake up from this and build megalithic buildings that we cannot even replicate in today's world. And we don't know how they did it. And we simply can't comprehend it. Well, there's a conspiracy theory called Orion conspiracy. And it's not a conspiracy theory at all. If you take the pyramids on the Giza plateau and the outer pyramids, not just the three that make the belt of Orion, and it and then you look to the sky, it is the constellation of Orion. But if you, but they said it's not mimicking it perfectly, so they ignored it. They looked at Angora Wat and they said, oh, it mimics exactly the star constellation Draco. Or they looked at the pyramid cities in China and they found, oh, that one looks exactly like Gemini. That one looks exactly like this star cluster. And what they found was that they couldn't match them up with the star clusters as they are now, so they went to a place where they spun it back in time to see what would be the date that is being told by these megalithic builders who woke up from this swoon 
and said, we are going to build these megalithic buildings. They all go back when they spun it back in time to where those star clusters were in 10,500 BC. That is when Rudolf Steiner said Atlantis sunk. And so they woke up from their swoon, entering into the dark age, and they said, we're going to make a time capsule that lets anyone in the future know a few things. The first thing, that our calendars are based upon what is called the body of the goddess or the platonic year. When you look at the vernal equinox point and it precesses and goes backwards in the zodiac, it takes 25,920 years for that to complete its cycle. That is called the body of the goddess. That is what is inscribed on an Omphala stone. That is what is, and that's why it was outside of the building, that is what is inscribed in every temple. That is what is described in your own breath, because 25,920 breaths is what you have in a day. And when it balances with the heart, then it is perfect. And so what we saw there is a change from the matriarchal culture that said the stars and the sun and the planets all come rushing, they believed it came rushing in, and Rudolf Steiner says the same thing, in a vortex from below us, rushing up. And then the forces of the sun, which were the forces of the goddess, let's remember, because they believed the sun was female. So the forces from the goddess come in, but they're, and the sun, but they're much faster than the forces coming from the stars. And when they meet, there's an incongruency where the vortex, vortices meet. And that causes not only the angle of inclination of the axis of your heart, but it also creates the heart. And it is there that the heart works then with the seven pillars. And the seven pillars are the seven planets. So you can see that the being of Anthroposophia, Rudolf Steiner says, incarnated for the first time in 2101 BC, a thousand years after the Dark Age started. He said at the same time, the being who we call Lucifer, and all the beings who fall and slow down in the process of creation, the mothers, they're not evil. They slowed down so that we would have a substance to look at that we call the outside world. It was a gift, it was a sacrifice. But once we transformed and the mystery of Golgotha, the turning point of time was reached, now all of those forces from the past are redeemed by us and they become Forces that are spiritual that help us return. So the being who fell from heaven, Lucifer, who we now often call Satan, the father of lies, the dragon, we, mid, we, we actually take this being Lucifer and mix them with Satan and we come up with this one being, but really there are two. And so what Anthroposophia does is she not only is the midwife of your soul, but she helps you be protected from these beings. But unless you have the mother there to help you fight against Lucifer, and unless you have Anthroposophia there to help you fight against Araman, you cannot have the victory. You have to have all the help that you can if you're going to do this. And so the being of Anthroposophia, as Rudolf Steiner said, is the being that you should consult for every single spiritual deed that you do. And then in the future, this being will literally become physical and that she was in every way a physical being, except that she did not have a body, and that a hundred years was one year for her. So when she started to, and she came to the earth at the same time that Lucifer incarnated in China in 2000 BC, and when the Abrionic age, the age of Abraham started, and when human beings started to use thinking in a new way so that they could become independent beings who had freedom and who could act out of love. It was really the incarnation of the being of Anthroposophia, who at that time was called the Great Mother, the Magna Mater, the Mother of All, also called Isis. And then later Steiner said that being was called Isis, the, so, uh, uh, Isis Sophia, but then later called Isis Theosophia, and then later, was called the being of philosophy, which means those who love Sophia, those who love wisdom, and then was changed into the being of Natura, that the scholastics worshiped and literally said that she was hiding behind nature. 
and then became this being of Anthroposophia. Now, Rudolf Steiner said there were three sources of Anthroposophy. The first was the work he did before Anthroposophy, which included studies of the Grail, studies of Rosicrucianism, and studies of the Michael School content. And then the second source was Anthroposophy, the work he did for Anthroposophy. But he said in the end of his life, the major source for his work was from the being of Anthroposophia. So this being works with the Holy Spirit to bring the Pentecost. The being of wisdom works with the being of Christ to bring what happened at the mystery of Golgotha. And the being called the mothers or the mother, of course, has been returned to her throne and has always served the father and is the face of the deep. And so what we now can understand is a trinity of the divine does not diminish the male trinity at all. And the wisdom that Rudolf Steiner gave when he said that the Gnostics were inspired by what Lucifer taught in the Central Asian Mystery Initiation Centers in China. And that that filtered down so that in the end, the Gnostics understood what it meant and how important it was to have a trinity of gods and goddesses. And so Lucifer's gift to Christianity was that Christianity could then say that it was made up of a trinity. But what was lost as the Hebrews and as the sun-oriented cultures that became male, what they lost was this wisdom that understood the mothers, the wisdom that understood who the being of the Kyriotides were and the way that that being had to merge with the being of Christ. And they certainly didn't understand that the evolution of the collective consciousness of human intelligence was a being called Anthroposophia that could teach you, that literally was somewhat of a representation of what Rudolf Steiner calls the realm of spiritual economy. Because when you or anyone else perfects something spiritual, Sophia enters into you and remembers it for all humanity. So Sophia, because she evolves one year for every hundred years, at the end of 2100 years was the time of Christ's incarnation, the mystery of Golgotha. She was 21 years old, this being Anthroposophia, this collective consciousness of human intelligence. And so she passed through all of the beings as they took their spiritual advancement, even under the cross. So you see that the blood of Jesus had to enter into the mothers, enter into the earth. We see that Mother Mary, or the being of Sophia, had to be there to resurrect, to redeem the actions of Eve. And we see that John the Divine, who was actually Lazarus raised, was then connecting to John the Baptist, who was the reincarnation of Adam. So you can see that on the cross, you have, it was the women who understood what Christ had taught, not the men, only one man, and he was one who had been raised by Christ himself and who was, of course, the brother of Mary Magdalene. And so there was only one man that could actually witness what happened there at the mystery of Golgotha, but the women understood it completely. And so it was the women who took the blood of Christ, who took the spear that stabbed his side, who took the veil of Veronica, who took all of the blood mystery, cult objects, relics, and kept them and preserved them. And that's what we're going to talk about next time when we talk about the science of the grail. Because once we understand that there are three different beings who Rudolf Steiner speaks about absolutely clearly, then we can understand that at that time, Rudolf Steiner couldn't say these things. It would have been so radical, even beyond the radical things of the fifth gospel and the other things he taught, to say that there was a trinity of the goddess would have been absolutely unspeakable at that time. And for anthroposophists to admit it is somewhat unspeakable to some of them. But it is easy, go to the book, and the three books, as we say, the 12, in other words, the star wisdom, are the 12 aspects of the goddess who really is a female Heracles. Remember, they call him Hercules. That's not his name. His name is Heracles, the hero of Hera. It was a woman. That was Psyche. And Psyche, of course, had a relationship with Eros. And Eros, of course, was the son of 
Aphrodite, who was called Cupid and had wings. Well, you can see all of these transfers happening in the Minoan culture, and you can see how the goddess was held as an image of Aphrodite and held as Helen. And so the transfer of the matriarchal to the patriarchal is something that ends the curse of Eve. It ends bloodletting of the Dark Ages, and it ends the idolatry that has led to so many religions leading us into materialism instead of to the golden age which we have actually entered. So when Tyler and I created these three books and the trilogy was created, we also knew it had to be an initiation because in today's age, you don't seek out a teacher. You don't need a teacher. You initiate yourself. Who is it that will be your teacher? The being of Anthroposophia. She will midwife every step of the way. She will connect you to your guardian angel. She will connect you to the archangel Michael. She will connect you to the higher beings and she will protect you because she, like Mother Mary, has this virgin nature to herself that is the gift that we must marry as we evolve our higher selves and realize that there is in fact a wedding that will take place, a wedding of your soul, a wedding of the Virgin Mary, a wedding of the Virgin soul to your spirit, which is the Christian spirit. And so nothing in what we have presented diminishes anything that Rudolf Steiner said. As a matter of fact, all it really did was to make sure that it was framed properly. And we show you in these books, the evolution of this being of Anthroposophia through literature, timed with exactly showing you how it evolved. We show you the 12 different labors of Sophia. We show you the temple of wisdom, which are really the virtues that you must develop if you wish to advance. And then we created, based upon ancient traditions, an initiation process, which teaches you a language of the goddess. But that language you have to decide for yourself. So we give you many choices. And we give you the cosmology that is needed if you are going to understand the apocalyptic concerns of our time. And once you understand that the being of Anthroposophia is threefold, and that she in fact is directly united in the chemical wedding, in a marriage with the male trinity, you will find that divinity has advanced. And as Rudolf Steiner said, the God you believe in is the God you can conceive of. And in this case, we need to make sure to add the word, the goddess that you believe in is not only the goddess that you worship, but it's also an aspect of your soul that you become. So we look forward to the next time when we take this further with the mysteries and the science of the Holy Grail.